I'm Andy Irwin, and this is The Storytellers. Hey guys, uh, so we have uh, a show that's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, unconventional for this one. So, you know, we're taking our break, finished season one, amazing. Had a, little, a lot of learning to do. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Uh, but it was, uh, but it was, man, it was something that was so exciting to kind of talk to our friends and kind of, kind of get this whole storytellers thing going and uh, try something new. So we're on break. We're about to go into season two. Season two is coming up. Amazing guest coming into that and. Uh, you know, I just finished one of the interviews today and it's awesome. It's so good. So in the meantime, while we're waiting on season two, we want to give you guys a chance to, uh, be able to ask your questions, to have a conversation and like what, what's on your mind and what things you want to know. And so we're just kind of a little bit of a mini show where we kind of do a Q and a thing. So joining us, uh, today is beach approach. He's, uh, on the staff here. He, uh, is, uh, our right-hand person and uh, is doing all the behind-the-scenes work uh, under Nick Carey and his producing uh, on the show. And so uh, it was this idea that kind of came to the table, and we decided to kind of do this Q&A show. So uh, welcome, welcome, Beecher. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Hey, before we launch into listener questions, yes, I thought I'd ask you a little bit about the podcast. Just sure. Because I'm curious. Cool, and love it. So, Let's do it. And so why don't you start with just like, Tell me how the podcast came about, if yep. you would, and then how has it been doing a podcast yeah. versus a movie? Well, uh, I have a face for radio, so it, it's it's a good fit. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, where it started, where where kind of the idea for the podcast started was um, uh, Jaron Weatherly, who works here on staff, was coming up with ideas of like, you know, at Kingdom, we had done a really good job, I feel, of working hard to make the films. Like, mm. You know, for us, it was like, hey, the quality of the films needs to kind of get better and better, and we need to kind of really invest in the movies. And so it became about that for years. But the problem was uh, we had, we didn't do a very good job of having a conversation with the audience. Uh, so as far as social media, as far as, um, you know, podcasting and behind the scenes, we really just were like, we don't have time. we got to make movies. But we watched what so many others were doing, whether it was The Chosen or, or you know, music br brands like For King Country or like, they're having a constant conversation. So Jaron kind of came to us with this idea of like, what if we did a podcast and a, a kingdom kind of branded podcast? And I was like, well, I'm not super interesting, but I think we've got a lot of interesting friends. And so what if, what if we kind of broke down that fourth wall and the conversations that we typically have with these people, we just let people be a part of that and kind of being behind closed doors and having a moment with, you know, a Dennis Quaid, you know, or a Dallas Jenkins or people like that. And just let them, you know, kind of get to know them as people. And uh, that really excited me. And I was like, well, the thing about, you know, uh, you know, our brand that is the most important is that word story. Hmm. You know, it's Kingdom Story Company. And so story is really what drives everything we do. And so I was like, I love storytellers. And storytellers doesn't just have to be film people. I mean... You know, it can be, you know, authors and musicians, and there's all sorts of different kinds of storytellers. Uh, but just being able to, to those people that have those stories, be able to find out what had inspired them and and how they kind of use that to inspire other people. And so my dad was in radio growing up. Uh, you know, he was in talk radio and uh, pretty opinionated. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I, I used to go to the, to the radio station and I would sit down behind the glass uh, engineer booth, hmm. and I would sit there with my baseball cards, and I would do baseball cards while my dad was doing talk yeah. radio. And so for me, you know, I was like, man, I don't know, I don't know if I'll know how to do this thing. But again, I'm just curious talking to people. And so uh, I, I was like, I'll give it a shot and see if I know what I'm doing. And the first couple of shows, I was terrified, but then it kind of got into routine. I was like, I like this, I enjoy it. It just reminded me of my roots being with my dad at a radio station. So uh, we're having a blast. I mean, it's like, I don't, we don't do it because it's, you know, any reason other than the fact that we love to tell stories and we want to invite people in and and we're having a lot of fun. Oh, I love that. How do you, just going on something you just said about being curious about stories, how do you nurture curiosity in your life? Like, how do you, how do you keep yeah. that spark alive, if you will, I guess? Yeah, you know, um, 
By the way, you have a good radio voice. This is uh, this is going really well. <laughs> maybe just, so maybe a face for radio. Yeah, too. yeah. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe I just found a co-host. Uh, you know, the how to keep the curiosity alive. I, I I think it's an it's an elusive thing. The creativity is one of those things that um, that, you know, that you can't really kind of put in a category and say like it has to be this. Mm. But there's certain things that nurture it. I think variety is really really important. I think you're you know. Creativity is problem solving, mm. and so it, it 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 takes the same amount of brain power and, and energy to write a script as it does to fix a carburetor. It's 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 all problem solving. You're having to really think hard about what you're doing, uh, and trying to find a creative solution. And a lot of times, when you do just one thing over and over and again, it, it just over exercises that muscle, and you burn out. So I like being able to do creative things that still you know, are different ways to work that out without it being just one thing. So this podcast is part of it. Like, you know, I like the idea that, you know, uh, an hour ago I was in the back room writing a script uh, and now I'm doing this. And then I'll be on a phone with producers talking about how to cast the movie. And then, and then I'll talk about how we're going to market this other film. And then, uh, and then I might have to get into editing. You know, there's always these things where you can put it down for a little bit and do something slightly different. And it just kind of recharges you. And then I think it's all about being around creative people. Mm. So, like when I, that, what I like with this show is being able, like, <laughs> when we did Randall Wallace's uh, interview. I mean, Randall Wallace, guy that wrote Braveheart, like this dude, like I mean, that's film legend. And uh, and I I remember like we had just started the podcast and he started listening, and so he reached out and he's like, "Hey, when are you gonna have me on the show?" I was like, "Uh, whenever you want, <laughs> like today," and. You know, for me to have an hour with Randall Wallace and just to kind of try to understand how he thinks and understand his story and where he came from, you know, for me, that just, that's that's what recharges me, hearing that. You know, that, that kind of stories um, is what kind of keeps me going. And, you know, when I sit down and I hear people telling the story, it was funny, I, I, was, uh, I was pitching this story. We were, I was with Mark Forster, who we're going to have on the show in season two. But Mark Forster, legendary director, uh, you know, has done some movies that I equate as perfect movies, like Finding Neverland, Stranger Than Fiction, Man Called Otto. Like he's like, like uh, Christopher Robin. Like he's so good. And I remember when I sat down with him, we were talking, and instead of there being a heightening of ego, when you have people that are really good at what they do, there's a lessening of ego. It's like he's great, and I'm pretty good, and we're fine. And so there's no reason to compare resumes. It's just like it gets down to like. Like, what are you excited about? And so we started swapping ideas, and he was telling me about this story he was working on, and then I, I pitched him this story that we're chasing and I'm trying to develop. And then that that Austrian accent, and it just really kind of kicked in, or I don't know if it's Austrian or Swiss German, but he's like got that 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 kind of German accent, and he's like he's like, and then what happened? And then what happened? And he's like, <laughs> and he's just leaning in. He's like, you have to do this movie, and I'm like, and so for me, it just created this energizing effect. Uh, to hear that it excited another creative mm. and and i think there's 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 kind of this other side of the coin to curiosity is jealousy it's like anytime you can trigger jealousy in a filmmaker you've done something really good because that sparks that curiosity of like ooh, i want to tell that story so it's a lot of fun that's good that's great uh okay a couple more podcast questions and then we'll move on to some film questions from from listeners um but highlight you've done i think season one was 15 episodes mm-hmm. You had Willie Robertson, Candace Cameron Bure, yeah. Randall Wallace, yep. Brian Welch. What anything stand out? Like what what stands out from from either what you learned or somebody you've talked to or a story you heard? You know, for each person, it was something really um, personal. Mm. Um, you know, I think the ones that I, I enjoyed uh, a lot of, um, I really enjoyed with Dennis Quaid talking about how when he was almost cast with Dukes of Hazard, you know, and him at this, this decision point of Dukes of Hazard or this first feature film that he was going to be in and the decision he made and the, the completely different alternate universe that would have existed if he had done the first decision. And, um, it's just amazing to see, to think about just we, those, those moments of impact that you don't know the significance of how it's going to ch- change the trajectory of your life and choosing which door to walk through that was exciting i think with um 
you know, Patricia Heaton talking about um, as she was struggling auditioning for Elaine Bennis on Seinfeld and, and then, you know, coming so close and then not getting that job and then having to kind of go back to the desert of struggling to, to eke it out for another almost 10 years until everybody loves Raymond came up and then everybody, she was just perfect for, uh, for Deborah Barone. And so like, uh, just, just seeing the, 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 the amazing path it takes of, of just thankless hours of working hard in order to kind of find your lane, mm. you know, uh, cause all, we see somebody uh, overnight success and we're like, Oh, look what and they, we don't see all the struggle leading up to that. And then the, 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 the one that was the big treat for me was Randall Wallace. When Randall mm. Wallace was talking about, you know, I was like, you know, with where the idea of Braveheart came from and him losing his job and him going in the other room and sitting down to the typewriter and, and typing out, they'll never take our freedom like that. Like that was a mic drop moment. And I was just like, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like eating popcorn, watching the movie and just being like, Oh my goodness, this is like film history. So, uh, so those are the ones, some of the highlights that I really, really enjoyed. Those are awesome. And then anything Willie Robinson says is, is hysterical <laughs> and really funny. <laughs> and so, uh, I like that I got under his, collar a little bit when i told a couple of the stories that he had you know when he was holding court had said and he's like i can't believe you're saying this on a podcast and i'm like so even after it was over i i, I texted i was like hey if you're uncomfortable i could take some of that stuff out yeah. he's like nah man it's a good story <laughs> so that's awesome all right so we asked some questions on social media yeah of listeners mm -hmm. and we said anything is fair game yeah filmmaking balancing filmmaking and family yep um so we got we got a handful of a handful of questions kind of in different in different sure. categories. So the first one though that I wanted to read is from Christy and she asked, How do you find stories to tell? Mm -hmm. And then how long is the process from idea to writing to producing to film to editing and to distribution? Uh that's a loaded one. You know, how how we find <laughs> the stories to tell, um, you know, typically we're not that smart. Uh uh, the really good stories just have tended to find us. Mm. Um, you know, when we kind of stumbled into true stories, that's where it kind of unlocked the whole thing for us. But, you know, the ones that have found us, like when we did I Can Only Imagine, doing a music biopic was not real popular at the time, mm. um, especially one about Christian music. And so, like, like everybody thought that that was, um, you know, going to be a joke. And... You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Everybody, you know, you know, the, the industry doesn't typically look forwards; they just look backwards. And the filmmakers tend to, tend to look forwards, but the industry looks backwards. They're like, "Oh, we need fifty more of those." And, yeah. But when we came out, like, they, 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 nobody was once said that was a good idea. But it was just a story that captured our attention, and we just kept saying, "I think there's something here." Mm. Uh, we couldn't let go of it. It was an obsession. And then when it came out, uh, it wasn't just us, but there was like like two or three other really big music movies that came out around the same time. I think Stars Born and Bohemian Rhapsody and then us. And, um, and all of a sudden now the music biopic was back and, uh, it, we didn't chase like, Oh, what we need is one of those music movies because that was actually a bad idea at the time. We chased that father son storyline. Mm. We can't get away from and I think it would be really powerful. And, and it's a hit song that is beloved by a lot of people. I think there's, I think it's worth telling. As far as like, you know, so so typically that those are the ones that stumble into our world. We're at a point now where a lot of people are bringing us stories, and so we have more than we can handle right now. But um, but that's kind of the origin. Um, so my encouragement to to people is to find a story that you have to tell, and it moves your soul to a point of obsession. You can't stop thinking about it, and those are the ones that are worth you know fighting for. Um, uh, and if it's just a kind of a ho hum, like ah, eh, I might be good. And, put it on the shelf and go look for something else. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as the process of how long it takes, it doesn't, it, it, I would say minimum uh, for a film, it takes two years Okay. from the, from getting the idea through the writing of the script, pre-production, making the movie to releasing it uh, is usually, is usually two years. Yeah. Uh, minimum. Uh, that can be a much longer in the case of, I can only imagine we worked on it for two or three years. No, three years we were talking for three years but it had been in development for seven years prior to that before we came on 
Uh, same with Kurt Warner's story with American Underdog. That had been in development for a long time. Um, I'm working on Fearless now, and you know that came into our orbit five years ago. Um, I've been personally working with the writers on the script for two years, Man. Uh, and we're getting close. So by the time that comes to the screen, it'll be probably be about ten years. Wow. So it's it's a you know as a producer or a director, you always want to have several films in development. So it's not like 10 years, then move on to the next one. Um, it's like you've got like five that are going in different stages of development. Um, you know, it's why like the cliche is like you ask any producer what you're working on. You're like, I have multiple films in various stages of development. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, uh, it takes time, yeah. but it's worthwhile. And then when you finally get to the point where the most sacred moment for any movie mm. Is when you get to show it for the first for the first time to a large audience. That be and that sounds terrifying. It's terrifying. I mean, it is terrifying. I mean, you're 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 definitely you're definitely the most insecure bundle of nerves. But when when you hear the first laugh or, or laugh or you, you feel the first surge of energy or cheer, and you're in that room and you're watching their faces as they're watching that story, it's the most sacred moment of filmmaking. Is that first time. And you, you, it's it's really you can't repeat it like it's usually that first time that it has that feeling for you. But uh, but that's what keeps you coming back. So, but it, that's worth it, and it takes it's a long it's a long process. I just read last night. Something about Dallas Jenkins, uh -huh. who directed the best Christmas time yeah. ever. Correct me if I'm wrong. Pursued the book rights or the film rights from the book for something like 15 years. Yeah, he'd been reading it to his kids as a bedtime story for, uh, for 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 a long time, and then he chased the rights, and it, it went through various stages until finally they brought it to to us, and we were talking about how to you know and. Uh, we brought it to Lionsgate and Lionsgate got really excited about it and decided to make the movie. So, but you know, he'd been fighting for that one for a long time, but it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. That's awesome. Um, all right. So this is sort of a, just a fun, uh, bucket list question, which actor or actress that you haven't worked with yet mm. would be on your bucket list to cast? Man, I would say my bucket list actor uh i've got a few uh tom hanks is on that list tom hanks is definitely on that list mm. um i would say uh julia roberts yep and then denzel washington would probably be the top i think i would be scared out of my mind <laughs> but you know we were we were, i was on so when we were mixing um when we were mixing uh American Underdog. We were sharing a sound stage, and uh, Denzel was on the stage next door. So, so it was stage six at Sony. We were mixing um, Underdog. He was mixing Letters to Jordan uh, with Michael B. Jordan. I think it was that was the name of the film, and uh, he had directed it. And so it was during COVID. We both had masks on, and he would come in, and go to his sound stage, and we shared a, a break room. Uh, but like you know. Uh, if he has his people had mine and you know you just try to be respectful yeah uh uh i know he was really intimidated to talk to me and that was he was, was that was absolutely no. what it was no he comes in but every time he would walk through the door i'd be like i'll figure something out to say to denzel say something to denzel <laughs> and then he would walk by and i'd be like i got nothing i got nothing <laughs> <laughs> and so finally oh dang finally and i'm just trying to form words yeah and i don't get starstruck often okay there, but there's a few that are like a whole nother level. And Denzel's one of those guys. And he carries a power to him. When he walks through a mm. room, like you feel like it's like, you know, like when you have a speedboat and you see the wake of the, and you got a little pontoon boat and it's a little wake, but you see one of those big ones comes in and it's like, it's a wake of waves on both sides. Yeah. Like when he walks through the room, that's what you feel. It's being it's I'm sheer raw power. Yeah. And very kind, but like carries weight. And so he walks in, walks by, and um, and he stopped to fix something with his bag. <laughs> so I looked down and I was like, I was like, say something, say something. I was like, hey Denzel, I'm really excited about your movie. 
that you're working on or that you that you have coming out. And then he stops and he looks at me with a smirk, pulls down his mask. He's like, which one? Oh, and I was God. like, I was like, uh, the movie you're doing with Michael B. Jordan. It looks like it's going to be great. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. I was like, or there's always Macbeth. And he had just, <laughs> they had just released the trailer for Macbeth. And he's like, that one, that one, that one. I'm telling you, best movie I've done in 20 years. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, that's great, man. And then I started kind of we started a conversation. I was like, how was Joel Co- Cohen to work with, you know, solo? And he's like, he's like, best movie. And we just get and all of a sudden we're in this conversation. And I'm like, okay, don't screw it up. Uh uh, so Denzel's one that I think I think I don't know if I would know how to, but I think I would just like, what do you want to do? But uh uh, but Denzel's one of those that is on the bucket list. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that actually, since you talked about Den- Denzel, um, somebody asked a question, uh, and if I can find it, somebody asked a question about being an actor's director. Yeah. So can you walk us through what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, what is an actor's director? Um, I think an actor's director just comes down to somebody that values that. They value they value acting, and you know what it presents for the actor is the attention they need to feel safe. Mm. And a lot of a lot of directors tend to feel like if if the movie's cast correctly and they're focused on what's happening, then it's the actor's job to figure it out. Um, in television, in particular, television like the actors a lot of times are thrown out in the deep end and there's nobody giving them notes. They're just coming up with what they're supposed to do. And it's about the words on the page and the writers are really the ones in control. Um, and so I've talked to people that have done like, you know, like kind of series kind of stuff uh, that are like, um, you know, procedural type things. Mm. And they're just like, I, I don't know if I'm doing it right or not. It's just what was in the script. And I, I did it, you yeah. know? And, and so a lot of times they're kind of hung out to dry. Sometimes in film, you have somebody that's very efficient and like, like you know, Clint Eastwood is is you know, uh, you know is very intense and very notorious about being very one to take kind of guy, and so you know, uh, I, I read somewhere that I think it was Matt Damon. Matt, and my, my story might be wrong, but Matt Damon had worked with Clint, and uh, and and everybody respects Clint so much because of his films, mm. they want to impress him. And so they're, they got done with the take, and Matt finished, and uh, and Clint's like, okay, yeah, that's good. We're moving. Let's 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 move on, like that. And then Matt was like, you know, Clint, I I, I just I, I think I, I need one more take. I think I could do a little bit better. I, I'd like to try some stuff. Could, could we just have one more? And then Clint leans in. He's like, why? You want to waste everybody's time, kid? And he's like, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> it's like, dang. It's a so. Uh, uh, you know, I think that kind of, you know, and yet he's an actor's director. Everybody mm. loves working with him. But I think what he brings to the table is he raises the bar so much with his intensity and his body of work and respect that everybody does their homework and they come in and really prepared. Yeah. Um, you know, but as far as for me, like it comes down to just creating safety. Yeah. Um, I I want my actors to feel that there is no us versus them. There is no me and you. It's we. Mm. Like we're in this together. It's good. And we're dance partners. And as a director, it might be my job to lead the dance and the steps. But if I set you up properly, I'm just the frame and you get to do all the twirls and the pretty stuff. And so the attention is going to be all on you because you're doing the stuff that's beautiful but I'm just there to give you a frame. I'm just the frame. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I think if they feel that support and you give them that safety, then with younger actors, you can keep them from freezing up. And I think a lot of times with younger actors, they try so hard to have their moment and create it and force it that they, they hold on to control. And the only thing that creates you know, a bad performance on film is the fear of giving a bad performance. Mm. It kind of becomes self-fulfilling. Ooh. Wow. And it's like, if I'm so focused on don't do bad, don't do bad, then you're going to do bad. You're going to look stupid because you're so controlling it that you don't even have a clue what the person across the table is doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with older actors, I think sometimes they can get to a place where they're tired and they hold back and they just say, okay, that's good enough. We're fine. Yeah. 
And I think when they feel safe, they feel like we're part of creating something together. And you bring them into that problem solving, you listen to them. And each actor is different. There's not a one size fits all. Like each actor is very much like, you know, for one, it might be feedback. The other one, it might be giving them space and giving them room to explore. One person, it might be tough love. And one person, it might be, you know, collaborative discussions. Um, you know, one person, it might be nuancing the script and, and, uh, um, and making sure that the words feel organic to them. And another person, it might be, tell me exactly what you want me to say. So, it, you know, each actor has their process. You just embrace it. But they need to feel seen and they need to feel safe. That's good. That's good. Okay, so Brooklyn asks. Yeah, Brooklyn. How do you know when a story has the spark and it needs to be told? Mm. And then also, can you go into a little bit more about the casting process? How do you find the right talent, especially when it comes to something like a biopic? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the spark, Brooklyn, the spark. Um, yeah, for me, uh, it has to trigger something universally relatable to me. And I think, you know, uh, for us, especially in stories of faith, the spark has to be that universal overlay, something that goes beyond just the faith component that is relatable to people regardless of where their background is coming from. Mm -hmm. And when you find that universal spark of broadly relatable, it provi provides a vehicle for the message. And so, um, you know, for us, we're always looking for that spark. So when we did it, I can only imagine it wasn't until we did... You know, we weren't sure that we wanted to do the script. I mean, when that script, we it, 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 it the original script ended with Bart at his dad's graveside and just saying one day he he wrote a hit song. I'm like that's not a movie. It's it's. But when we found out the story about Amy Grant pulling him up on stage, and giving him song, his song back, and we're like, oh, that's a movie. We have our we have our spark. And then we just said the universal overlay was the father wound. Every child wants their father to stand in approval at the end of their life. Mm. No matter if they had a good relationship with their dad or bad, Dang. or didn't even know their dad, they they crave that affirmation, the validation, and so we kind of engineered it with this idea of this uh, moment at the end when we're in the Ryman, and uh, it circles around the stage after he finishes the song, and it's an empty auditorium, and backlit with this bright light is Dennis Quaid playing the father, standing in approval starting to clap for his son, come back around to a full arena that is now standing ovation. They're like, that's your spark. That's your moment. And so if we know how we want to end a movie, then you got to reverse engineer. How do we earn that ending? How do we create that, that deficit to be able to fulfill it there? And, uh, and you work backwards. And so, but it's those kind of sparks where it's like, that's a movie I want to tell. Um, you know, each one has that intangible, intangible thing, but it's usually something where, as a filmmaker, you can already see the movie in your head. Cool, and that's what's worth it. As far as how to cast that, especially when it comes to true story, uh, true stories, we, we have a belief, uh, kind of a core belief, of casting essence over imitation. Um, I want to find an actor that has the essence of the character that we want. It's a version of them mm. that's already there. Instead of saying, "Hey, I want you to act like this person." Uh, you know, it, it, you know, and so we go through, so like in the case of, you know, Kurt Warner in American Underdog, you know, we, we were looking through like who all to cast as that. And I kept watching Kurt Warner and then I kept watching my friend Zachary Levi. I just seen Shazam. Went back and forth, back and forth until, you know, and I already knew Zach, but I was just like, he is Kurt Warner. Like the essence, the body language, the, the humor. And so uh, I, I pitched him pretty hard. I was like, that's, that's the guy. And, uh, and so to see the two of them side by side on the sidelines, they don't look exactly like Zach's a couple inches taller and Kurt's, uh, you know, a little bit uh, more built. Uh, you know, Zach's going to hear this. He's going to hate me now. <laughs> but they, they, he had the same boyish in, uh, yeah. essence. And yeah. so that's what we look for. I love that. That's awesome. Okay, this is a little bit more of a business side of film great question well, then i'll lie about something okay great. great uh what is the best way to raise capital <laughs> for developing our projects and then when pitching concepts what do distributors versus investors versus production companies look for in a pitch deck wow 
<laughs> this is where I just make up an answer. I don't know. <laughs> like, like John Voigt. John Voigt called me when I, he always calls me from an un- unlisted number. He called me. He's like, is this Andy Irwin? I was like, John Voigt. He's like, is this Andy Irwin, the, the movie mogul? I was like, I was like, I don't know, John. I'm, I'm faking it till I make it. He's like, that's it. That's the key. I was like, I don't want him to see that I'm a fraud. He's like, never let him see. Never let him see. And so, oh, man. Uh, always cracks me up. That but, is awesome. I love that. You know, for me, raising capital, um, I mean, I, I, there's a lot better people you could ask for advice there. Um, uh, for me, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the nature of the money is more important than the amount. So um, it's not about going to get a dollar figure because you can get that and have a big headache on your hands. Okay. It's about finding people that are idealistically aligned with the, the story that you're telling and the why behind you telling that story. Mm. Um, finding somebody that really believes in that. And so like the people that funded, I can only imagine – uh, uh, really, it wasn't about, it was a double bottom line for them. It was, they, they really believed in the story. They believed in our why, and they felt like the business model, the numbers that, that, you know, we were doing the film at and the opportunities, they felt like it was, it was, a you know, uh, worth the risk. You know, the other thing we do whenever we, um, try to raise money for a film is you, the, the investors need to be of a certain net worth and they need to also clearly understand the high risk category of film mm-hmm. film is one of the highest risk highest reward uh, uh uh things that you can do with your money yeah like uh it takes a lot of uh guts to invest in film because a lot of them just don't work mm. um so the nature of the money is more important than the amount um secondly like what what are they looking as far as for his pitches and that type of stuff yeah you know, um you know i think for each of them what we try to do is connect uh them investing in a story by s- by telling them a story, you know, and they want to be able to insert themselves in that narrative. Um, you know, I've never been much of a pitch deck guy. Uh, I've got several friends that are. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I tend to go speak from the heart. So mm-hmm. I've, I, I have a good track record of being able to get a green light from the studio just with a verbal pitch of saying, wow. this is what I want, this is the story, this is why I feel like it's powerful, and just being able to kind of verbally do it and just walk them through the story in a way where they can see it yeah but that's my style um in the past what john and i would do is we did um uh we did instead of pitch decks uh we actually did sizzle reels and we did like a concept videos and so like for woodlawn we actually raised some money to be able to go out and actually shoot a concept video and so we raised a hundred thousand dollars to do this 10 minute concept and brought in Sean Astin, who ended up being in the movie, and kind of uh, shot how we wanted the football to look, and we shot like a couple of moments, and kind of fleshed it out. Um, uh, and 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 like that concept video is beautiful, mm. um, uh, and that really helped us get, kind of get that green light. It was the same thing we did for for uh, when we did I still believe with the, I still believe with the studio is we did a concept video with interviews. It's kind of like a little docudrama kind of 15 minute behind the scenes kind of this is the story we want this is the feel that's good for visualizing it when it's something that they don't really clearly get um i think i've gotten a little bit away from that in recent years and gone back towards um you know some other ways of doing it but uh but that's always really effective but then my buddy the other day uh adam anders came in and had a pitch deck for two projects that he was wanting to do and he had started using AI for how to develop the pitch decks. Interesting. And the visuals in it. And, and, and I, get, I get so mad because I was like, Man, I want to try that with my next pitch deck. <laughs> so I sat down and started doing it. And every, every picture had like a third arm growing out of somebody's <laughs> forehead and, and looked like you know, a deformed nose that was curled up. And like it just, it, none of it looked like what I wanted. And, but, the stuff that he had developed for this pitch deck was so uh, beyond, I, like it really was shocking uh, what he was able to create. And so it's an interesting technology to harness. I know it's a controversial deal right now. Um, um, it's, you know, so, but for something like that, it's an interesting tool. What role do you think it plays? Just guesstimation. What role do you think it plays in the future of film and television? You know, 
I think it needs to be regulated, um, especially when it comes to the you know name, image, and likeness of of actors. Um, you know, I think that it's unfair to be able to to steal somebody's image and instead of you know um, uh, them being able to do their job. So I I I I think it needs to be regulated, but um, I also know that the industry is pretty greedy mm. and they're always looking for cheaper ways to do the job. Um, so I think given that, I think it'll probably play a more significant role. I, I, th I, th I saw that what's his face a read from, from Netflix was saying that he believes and instead of making it 50% cheaper, it just makes it maybe 10% more powerful, uh, at making movies. Hmm. So he okay. sees it as something to enhance, not to something to take away. Okay. I, I also don't know that I buy that <laughs> because yeah. because I do know that the industry does gear towards what's the cheapest way we can do this. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I think it's a mixed bag. I think it's here. I, I mm -hmm. You can rail against it, but I think it's here, so I don't know. But I do think regulating it and keeping it from turning into Skynet and, term, and, Termin and Terminator is the biggest thing we need to worry about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. Uh, somebody wants to know, Hannah. Yeah. Hannah wants to know any update on a fearless slash Adam Brown movie ah. and then asks about adapting a book into a movie. Yeah, man, uh, that H Hannah, thank you for the question. Um, uh, fearless is one I'm really excited about. I'm actually, that was what I was in the other room just a minute ago writing. Uh, we, we've been uh, working on just polishing the script and Jason Hall is, delivering his his draft and then i'm i'm just helping kind of massage and polish some things that i want to to feel a certain way and then for him to kind of finish it up um but jason hall and john gunn are the writers mm. and uh and so jason hall brings such a pedigree from uh american sniper and just writes the thing i like about jason's writing is he's able to really go against the grain and it's so unexpected and specific and uh to get moments you don't see coming uh, he's so good at it um and so i you know he's great and then john gunn is just the master of bringing the heart and the humanity to it and so they they, they it's jason's script and john came on and so we're we're close on that script and then we're going to start but lionsgate's really excited about it and then i got to convince them to uh you know they're going to give me a list of actors that i got to go get and uh and then if we get that off the ground then you know hopefully gets the budget that i really want to be able to do it and yeah. then hopefully we're making a movie sooner than later so awesome. uh, i think there's a couple other movies in line that we've got on the docket uh to do so i probably would say you know we're a year or so away from legitimately doing it but it's getting closer and it's getting better and it's really the script is really strong really that's strong. awesome when you're writing a script, or in this case, making minor adjustments like in Fearless, are you writing with an actor in mind, or or is that too? Does that get too specific? You know, a lot of times we will. I mean, uh, uh, we've always said that I can only imagine it was written for Mel Gibson. You know, before okay. we before we, you know, and then Dennis Quaid was absolutely the right guy for the role, and it, it, he was just he just brought it to life. It was a it was a it was a the right movie for him but originally we wrote that for mel gibson so everything was channeled in mel's voice and then we thought about john goodman and then ultimately dennis was the right guy and uh dennis uh killed it but it was def definitely written kind of in a very mel gibson-esque role and dennis quaid just stepped into those shoes so yeah. you try to not to get too locked in on who it has to be mm -hmm. but you do kind of have a version in your head and you can't help yourself yeah. You just, you have to visualize this is who I see. And, um, you know, when you do that, then um, a lot of times it just gives you an archetype. But then sometimes you don't get that person. You have to get somebody like that person. Yeah. So you just write every every role for Denzel yeah. from now on. <laughs> from now on. And hopefully one of them <laughs> and works. Then, and then every time I pitch him, I'm just like, hey, man. <laughs> Hi. Remember me? <laughs> That's right.
Matt had a question uh -huh. and his son just started a YouTube channel. Right. He's nine years old. Wow. Uh, yeah. Him. And his son would like to ask you, what should kids his age at nine years old start learning today if they want to make movies when they grow up? Wow. Nine years old, man. That's impressive. Did he, did he say what his son's name was on there? He did not say his son's name. He gave us his YouTube channel. Okay. But what, what's his YouTube channel? His YouTube channel is called Kid Intern. All right, Kid Intern. All right, so speaking to the Kid Intern, the fact that you're nine years old and doing anything, you're way ahead of the game. Um, I, I didn't start doing stuff until I was 15. My brother was 12. And uh, my brother might get super jealous that you beat him to the punch and are, are three years ahead of him. So uh, go for it. Cheering for you, kiddo. Um, you know, I think that the thing is, is have fun with it. You know, um, I, I think the thing that fuels any of us that have stayed in this long term are people that haven't learned the, haven't lost the joy of the job. And, you know, whenever I step onto a film set with John Voight, uh, he would always elbow me in the ribs and say, Hey kid, do you see what we get to go do? We get to go play pretend for a living for a couple hours. And, you know, so I would say this is, these are the years to have fun with it. And you learn so much more uh, and retain that knowledge when you're enjoying it. So I would say, you know, you look back at the Spielbergs and the M. Night Shyamalans and the people like that. They started when they were your age making little films with their friends and just trying stuff and just having fun with it. It's a game. It shouldn't feel like a job yet. You got plenty. Of, you've got you know, a whole lifetime of head for it being a job. Enjoy it. Have fun. And then as far as a resource, my biggest encouragement is to watch all the little behind the scenes videos that they do uh, on DVDs for movies that are appropriate for you. Like a lot of Pixar movies and things like that. Watch the behind the scenes of how they're made and, you know, listen to the DVD commentary. And it's a way for you to kind of understand this is how they think. And uh, ones like that, are really helpful just to understanding how other people did it. Um, but those are the things I would do. But I would just, if anything else, don't lose it being fun. Keep it fun. And that's going to keep you doing it, kiddo. So we're rooting for you. Nine years old. Man. Clint Hanna asked, I'd love to know more about the transition period between making music videos for bands like Skillet and Casting Crowns. And then moving on to a feature like October Baby. And what was that like? What was the transition like? Was that difficult? Um, yeah, Clint, the, the, the thing that's hard is anytime you develop a reputation in one lane of this industry, anytime you switch lanes, you do have to pay your dues over again. And so it's always a scary jump because it's like, hey, music videos was paying the bills for us for a long time. Mm. And we had a certain level of notoriety or reputation at that time doing music videos. Um, and we had a lot of fun. Um, but the idea of going from interpreting something for an artist to becoming the artist was a scary one. Because um, then you're like, do I, what do I have to say? And does what I have to say matter? And am I able to transition? And do that and so we had been doing music videos especially with the rock videos like skillet or red or ones like that we had done things that were kind of more action oriented oriented and like blowing stuff up um and uh you know in fact you know if, if we didn't know how to end a music video we just blow something up so uh <laughs> we you know that was kind of our background so when we stepped into october baby john and i talked and john had written the script with Teresa preston and John was like, I, I think that our first movie out of the gate, we shouldn't do any crutches on like anything that's gimmicky. It just needs to be um, a, a character drama that's all about just the simplicity of telling the story. And that was terrifying. It was like, you know, we didn't have any of our crutches. But we didn't start off doing stuff that was anywhere similar to what we were doing in music videos. It was... Um, very much its own little piece. And so we raised a micro budget, try to keep it low. We didn't try to get out ahead of our skis and try to do something that we're like, we can execute this. And um, we feel that it, it just needs to be about the drama. And October Baby's not a perfect movie. Uh, you know, 
the first couple of movies we did were were bumpy. Mm. Um, but there are moments in that that I'm really proud of. I'm really proud of the cast. Uh, I'm really proud of like the, the Jasmine guy scene. I'm really proud of that. Uh, really proud of the the scene with uh, Rodney that played the priest. I thought Rachel Hendricks did a fantastic job. James Austin Johnson that was in the cast is going on to be on Saturday Night Live. He was a 19 year old kid that had just gotten started, and now he plays Trump and Biden on on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> which is hysterical. It's just every time I see him, he's just he was such a goofy, funny kid. Uh, but yeah, that was that was kind of the transition is making that jump. I love that. Okay, Sydney asked a question that I thought was really good. Okay. Uh, we've got a few more. Yep. She said, what is the difference, in your opinion, between being a Christian who is a filmmaker and a Christian filmmaker? Ah, the switch foot question. <laughs> the classic switch foot. Um, there's no difference. There's no difference. I, I think, uh, you know, if somebody asked me in each version of that question, I'd be like, they're like, which one are you? I'd be like, yes. You know, there, there doesn't have to be this dichotomy between all those things. It's like, you know, any filmmaker preach, preaches, they put what they believe out there mm. into the world, especially if they're writing. Um, you know, we just have the opportunity to do that from a faith standpoint. And so, um, you know, for us, like, I absolutely am a Christian. And I look for stories that are so entwined with faith that you can't surgically separate them. Uh, but... You know, when I tell the story, I just tell it the best I can. And in the case of like, you know, American Underdog, it just needed to be a really good sports movie. Mm. Um, in the case of Jesus Revolution, my brother and Brent McCorkle tell the story that needed to be about a revival. You know, each of those has value. Mm. Um, yeah. And and if I'm really comfortable that my faith is at the core of who I am, then I don't have to apologize for either. Yeah. Um, and so I think this question because I, I was at this <laughs> um i was at the, i was at, i was at i was at this thing at sundance and there's a room full of of uh christians that were wanting to be in the film industry that a lot of them were younger kind of college age and uh i won't out who it was but there was we had just done woodlawn and and we were finishing imagine and they didn't know i was in the room so I was just going to somebody invited me to check it out. And uh and so we um we're sitting there and they went around the circle and they were talking about why uh um faith films needs need to be better and why they were cheesy and why they were horrible and they just bashed it. And and it got to me and it's like, oh, there's a faith filmmaker in the crowd. <laughs> Dang. And and I I smiled and the guy that had gone just before me was a professor at a university, and I won't say which one, but he uh, uh, he's like he's like what we need is you know these films are so we we need authenticity and we need voices that are authentic. And he just kind of went off on this whole soapbox, and then it got to me, and they said, "What do you think?" And I said, "I agree. They need to be authentic, but we need to define what the word authentic means." Mm. if mm. authentic means we need to be accepted and liked and validated, then that's a weak place to come from. If authentic means we need to tell stories that resonate on a soul level that we believe and earn the right to say that well, and then let people make up their minds what they think, that's it. If you chase acceptance, you won't get either side. If you chase authenticity and tell stories that are bold, then you're going to turn some heads mm. and, uh, and I stand by that. So, you know, I think when you answer that question, it's like, what do you want? And I think what we need is boldness. We need authenticity. And those can make really great pieces of art on either side of that definition. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, to start to kind of wrap it up. Yeah. Um, what is next for Kingdom? As far as films and also just like somebody asked a question, Naomi asked a question about uh, content, yeah. types of content. Right. So... You know, is there a place, does Kingdom get into sort of fictional storytelling? Yeah. Uh, you know, is it always going to be true to life stories? Is it going to be, is there going to be kids content? What is, What does that paint the vision? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think the thing is, is um, you know, up until this point, it has been true stories, but we're starting to branch out from that. 
Okay. Uh, we're still going to have a big component of true stories. I don't know that I would personally ever direct something that's not a true story. It's just my voice. But we're starting to work with other filmmakers that are wanting to do other things. And there's room at the table for all of us. And so we've got some exciting things coming. Um, some I can talk about, some, some I can't. We just signed a deal with a filmmaker for a, um amazing supernatural thriller that's a big piece of IP. Um that uh that we're working on developing right now and i can't say what it is but it's it's a, it's a cool deal um we uh uh you know and i'm i'm you know definitely have fearless we've got another sequel to a film that we've done before that we'll be announcing shortly that will be going not too long that's i'm excited about mm. um there is uh um a couple of movies that we're chasing that i'm thrilled about we've got um uh, I'm having to be really cryptic. Uh, the ones I can, the ones I can talk about, the the two that we have coming out in the fall, uh, we helped uh, come on board with a movie called White Bird. Mm. White Bird is uh, by Mark Forster, who that, that talks about. Mark is like he's a master storyteller, and so it's a spinoff to the movie Wonder that Julia Roberts and Jacob Tremblay and Owen Wilson were in. So that hit movie, it's a spinoff from that, and they did okay. a they did a graphic novel book that went along with it that was a spinoff that followed one of the characters, uh, Julian, who is the bully in the film, who goes home to his grandmother and finds out the history of his story and his family's story and about the importance of kindness. And mm. it is a beautiful story um, uh, about uh, Christians putting their life on the line uh, uh, for this little Jewish girl. Oh. And it's a it's a poignant story. It's timely. And when I watched it, I was like, what do we have to do to be involved in this? Wow. So um, so that's exciting. That's coming out in October. Okay. And then in November, we have Dallas Jenkins from The Chosen, uh, the project he chased for years. Uh, and that's best Christmas pageant ever. Yeah. And so we were on set making that in Winnipeg, uh, watching it come to life. It was <laughs> it was one day on set. I showed up and I'm like, hey, Dallas, I'm here. I'm here to work. You know, whatever I can do to serve your vision, we're about it. I'm here to help you help you as a producer. And he's like, I've got some second unit stuff tomorrow. Could you uh could you film it uh, with the team? I was like, Oh, yes, yeah, sure, I'll I'll help. I was like, what, is it filming inside? He's like, No, it's outdoors. <laughs> so negative twenty degrees. I'm like, oh. me and my big fat mouth. So uh mm. but that the film is great. So Judy Greer, Lauren Graham from Gilmore G Girls, and then comedian P Pete Holmes, and then this eclectic cast of the most amazing kid actors that you could have seen in a long time. So that one, it's it's like, it's so stylized and interesting. It's like a Wes Anderson film meets a Norman Rockwell uh, Christmas card. It's it's just, wow. it's nostalgic, it's stylized, it's beautiful. And so that one will be out in November everywhere. So keep an eye out for that. And then I want to wrap it up and just ask for, you know, what podcast you're listening to, what books you're reading. Just, just you know, because I... I love to learn. I know we love to learn. And mm -hmm. um, and so just some resources for people, whether they're into film or whether they just yeah. love beautiful stories or whatever. As far as like, you know, podcasts I'm listening to, um, I you know, I, it's new for me. I've, I've just kind of gotten into it. I've really enjoyed, uh, I've really enjoyed the Smartless. I've really enjoyed um, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. I think that's hysterical. And I love just the ADD nature of that show. Um, and again, fly on the wall, just get to participate in what they're doing. Um, I, I've been listening some to Candace Cameron Bure's podcast. Uh, I'm excited that we're about to go out and be co-hosts on uh, on her show uh, soon. And so I've been listening to her show, and I just think she has an ease to how she does what she does. So it's a new it's a new discipline, you know, for me. Um, and uh, and so that's cool. Um, the uh, uh, the, as far as books that I'm reading, I, I started, um, man, I started, like, it, it's not one that I'm learning a lot from, but uh, uh, Michael Crichton just came out with uh, a book posthumously called Eruption. Okay. And so this guy that wrote Jurassic Park. And and so yeah. and so he, he, I think he died like 10 years ago, but his widow got all of his old no notes on this book and gave it to another author uh i think it was james patterson i can't remember exactly gave it to him to 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 edit and to finish 
and they just released it as a co-author thing. And so I started reading it and it kind of gives you all the feels of like a Jurassic Park type thing. So I've been having fun with that one. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks for uh, flipping the roles. Yeah, you did and, great. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been we, fun to talk. It was great. Great show. I I, I enjoyed being a guest. So <laughs> thanks, buddy. We'll yeah. see you guys uh, season two coming out soon. Uh, stay tuned uh, for more storytellers. Appreciate you guys. The Storytellers is a Kingdom Story Company production. It is produced by Nick Carey with production assistance from Ben and Justin Bailey. Our executive producers are Kevin Downs and Brandon Gregory. Social media for the show is run by the team at Troops and Allies, and our music is Twisted Rooster by Tommy Prophet. Special thanks to Jaron Weatherly and our entire team at Kingdom Story Company. We have so many exciting guests coming up this season. To ensure you don't miss any of them, subscribe to The Storytellers for free on YouTube at Kingdom Story Company or wherever you listen to podcasts. For exclusive first looks at our upcoming films, behind the scenes content, and invitations to advanced screenings, join the conversation as a Kingdom Insider at KingdomStoryCompany.com and follow us at Kingdom Story Company across all platforms. As always, thanks for joining Andrew Irwin and his friends on The Storytellers. Storytellers.